Okay, good morning everyone. Um, so we get just get started quick a bit of um, just a bit of feedback about the meeting. So Dr. Marlin and myself were talking after them and we were really happy with the group's progress um, by and large. There's a few outcomes from the meetings though that um, I will follow up with a memo. So it's intentional just to collect the number of the issues that various groups raised and then to feed that back to all of you. And these are issues around um, pricing of fuel gas, pricing for the switch condenser that you'll need for your economics, what is the MARR for our company? What is the timeline over which you should do your, sens uh, your NPV and then use that in your sensitivity analysis? Um, so all these features, I'll be issuing a memo in this uh, next few days regarding that. Uh, and then you also have noticed in, the, in one of the memos, it had said this wor uh, wording around your group's <coughs> focus area. So I'll also clarify what that focus area is as you'll see um, this week we start with the safety topic and the safety section will be a major chapter in your report and I'm not expecting you to do the safety topic on the entire flow sheet. It's too large a section to do so what each group will get in an email from me is a subset of the flow sheet for which you will do your safety analysis. So as we start to talk in today's class about safety incidents um, and in next class about the layers of safety in a company uh, we'll, you'll have that email now in your head and know which unit you're going to be applying it to. Okay, so, so we'll look for that sometime later this week, probably by Wednesday. I also have the midterms and I'll return those at the end of the class today. So let's, um, let's just uh, refocus where we are in this course. We've had several weeks of economics right at the beginning and then we looked at operability for a number of weeks ending on Friday's class. And now we're going to look at safety. Safety is our third major topic in the course and then there's two others, one on engineering ethics and one on troubleshooting. Uh, this is the first year that I've actually switched safety and operability around and I like the way that it's working. Um, you've now seen the reasons why we change our flow sheet from that base case to adding things like multiple pumps. Um, how you factor in economics when you decide whether you should have one heat exchanger or a parallel heat exchanger. So everything really up to now has been either driven by money or we're using money to decide to improve our process in some way to make it more advantageous. This next section, money is certainly a factor, but because it comes down to safety and because safety has features that are not numerically quantifiable, uh, we typically work in the following way, that we aim for a certain base level of safety and we spend whatever money is required to achieve that level of safety. So we'll get to that point. We'll look at what an acceptable safety rate of fatalities is, and then we aim for that. So let's take a look at a little bit of, of uh, some terminology here, and then the rest of the class will be looking at some case studies. So just to give you an idea of where we're heading, um, today we'll look at some, some examples of poor, poor safety in a company and where those led to serious catastrophic accidents that are well known and in fact you'll research uh, one of them here in the class with me as we as we study that together. We'll then look in Wednesday's class at the safety hierarchy. I'll in fact even introduce that today and show you how that safety hierarchy factors in to these case studies. We'll look at pressure relief and then we'll end off with hazard and operability studies and layer of protection analysis. And in this last workshop we are, we've already had that um, as a background for this area. So when we're dealing with the safety topic, there's uh, some ways in which we quantify um, safety in a process. And that's one of the first ways, really. And these top first two are more the British or European way of doing it. And the last one is North American. Um, but both numbers, both types of numbers exist on either side of the world. Um, so it's not like one is exclusively used in one area. But this fat fatal accident rate Okay. The way you can interpret this is if you take a thousand engineers or a thousand people working in whatever job they're working at for their entire career. And by the end of the, that time frame of a typical career, some number of them would have been killed due to an accident. Okay. So maybe three out of those thousand uh, were killed. 
and that's the fatal accident rate. So the number of fatalities in 1,000 people's working lifetimes. If we take that, that number, we can multiply it by the number of hours worked divided by 10 to the 8, um, and that gets you a number called the fatalities per year, and I'll show you a calculation for that. Okay, so that's the, that's the, the rate at which people have uh, these incidents occurring. Then OSHA, the OSHA incident rate. So OSHA is a, North Amer uh, is a U.S. body. It's not North American. It's U.S. Occupational Self Safety and Health Administration. Um, it's, a f it's mandated or created by federal decree. And so OSHA um, has this rate, the number of illnesses and injuries per 100 work years. Now, Dr. Marlin, when... Um, he teaches the section, he often shows or gives examples of how companies will use these definitions and twist them to their advantage. So for example, he gave, he gave an example of when he was working in Esso, one of the largest companies in, in US. Dr. Marlin had observed this incident when someone had injured themselves with a broken arm. The company did not record that because they still made the person, sh make the, made the person show up at work but put him behind a desk. So he was normally an operator, he had to lift and move things around, but with a broken arm he couldn't do that. So put the person behind a desk, he's still working, so that doesn't um, increase their incident rate. That person is still there at the company doing regular work. The other example that he gives is the fatal accident rate. So what companies will do is they'll have an accident, but it's not one of their employees, it's an outside contractor who had the accident at the company site. So that does not affect the company's fatal accident rate because it's a third party who had the accident at the company site. Okay, so when you look at these numbers, there's a bit more, bit more behind it and it's, it can be manipulated in some ways. So just be aware of that. Now, let's get an idea of the FAR, the fatal accident rate. So, Take a look at that table, and, and what's your first response? What's your gut feel from seeing those numbers? Any observations there? Okay, so three people in their lifetime will die from simply staying at home out of a thousand. But only four in the chemical industry. Okay, so we actually do a pretty good job already. And we do a pretty good job because of our knowledge of what unsafe systems can lead to, right? And we'll also see that a number of this is being driven by some changes in the industry since the 70s. So in the, back in the 70s and 80s, uh, companies will often have just ignored the safety literature, even though it had just started to emerge. And you'll see a number of these accidents we look at today occurred in the 70s and 80s. So changes that we've made, have, we've learned from some of these incidents. And that's what I hope to encourage you to do as well and perpetuate this knowledge that the engineering community has built up. And we, we actually have learned from each other's mistakes. Okay, maybe not as rapidly as we should have, but we certainly have made some changes. Um, I'll get the date for that from Dr. Marlin. I'll see, see what his source is. Yeah. And the scope. I'm not sure what the scope is. Yes. Yeah, that's a good good observation. Which countries does it refer to? Okay, but what's interesting there is we can see that the mining industry is and construction industry is um, very unsafe. What we aim for typically is that when you go to work, you're as safe as you would be at home. Okay, that's our goal, is to aim for that rate. Yes, Brandon? Um, so asbestos, this is uh, for, uh, this, this could be, I don't think it's wrapped up in the chemical industry. It's a, it's a resource industry, so similar like mining. Um, but um, that, that number, for example, was Quebec. Right? Uh, a lot of that data comes from Quebec, which is one of the only world sources of asbestos. Um, and the federal government and the asbestos industry denied any 
sort of um, problems from that industry until very recently. Okay, so notice here that going to work is going to be a lot more unsafer than simply staying at home and being at work. Okay, so there's that, that risk of traveling to work and back. Now, we can work with these numbers. So, uh, for example, there's cigarette smoking. Um, 40 is 10 times higher than the chemical industry. But if we're looking at the fatal, fatality rate, I'd say take the, the FAR, so in this case, the chemical industry's FAR is 4, multiplied by the working day, 8 hours per day, 5 days a week, 45 weeks a year, divided by 10 to the 8. And that's how you get the, uh, the F, that fatality rate. So it's a number that should be in the order of 10 to the minus 5 fatalities per year. Sorry, what's the four? Oh. 4 is the FAR for chemical industry. Okay, so that just gives you an idea of how we quantify those numbers. Now, um, we obviously want to, that staying at home is literally staying at home. It's not things that you do outside of work. So if you have rock climbing as a hobby um, or skydiving as a hobby, that's not included in the at-home statistics. But everything at home is, that's our goal. It's really to aim for being as safe as you would ordinar ordinarily be um, now, when we're at work, uh, this is an important point to bear in mind that there are many risks. We can minimize the risk of, say, one reactor or minimize the risk of a heat exchanger or minimize the risk of a pump. But what happens is, as we saw, we connect these up in series. And as you'll see in the case studies today, we rely on the combined version of those units to work successfully and not cause an accident. So that's the critical part. We can engineer a particular unit to be safe on its own, but we also need to look at a more global point of view of our flow sheet of how one unit cascades into the next, and that's often where the hard part is. We can do a hazard and operability study on one unit and make it very safe, but we need to be more global in our view sometimes and consider multiple causes as they propagate through multiple units. And then the other important aspect is we can make our process safe, but internally we also need to consider the people around us. So many of the incidents um, were, that you'll see here today were self-contained. They only injured people on the site, um, which would have been us if we had been those workers. But in uh, one of the most catastrophic incidents, uh, Bhopal, it, it killed 3,000 people immediately and 16,000 people uh, over the next few weeks after that. So that's a tremendous number of people um, that were injured around the, the site. And then the final idea that uh, this is intuitively obvious to us, but let's just uh, write it out here. An accident can have the same fatality rate if it occurs with high frequency and kills a small number of people per incident. So here's an accident, uh, here's, a, here's an event that occurs with a very low, pro with a high probability, 0 0.001 probability, and every time it occurs, it, it kills one person. Conversely, like a nuclear reactor is very well engineered and has extreme levels of safety precaution, so the frequency of nuclear accidents occurring is extremely low, but when they do occur, it may, um, kill a high number of people, okay? So we have the same idea with the aircraft industry. The aircraft industry is, is extremely well in um, safety equipped. So aircraft have three to four times the redundancies of sensors and computerized systems, okay? Four engines on your aircraft type of idea. We've got that multiple layers, but when an ac aircraft accident does occur, it typically wipes out the entire aircraft and people in it. Oh, sorry, okay, it shouldn't be, but <laughs> it's, it's, that's if you use the number of four, that's what you get. And but that doesn't make any sense. Because like, that would mean that maybe like 10,000 or 100,000 years of fatality. Fatalities per year, so it needs... It's minus five fatalities per year. Per working person's life. Okay, so it's one person, right? So if you take a, a group of people at a company, yeah. So if you... It's eight hours per day for one person, five days a week, 45 weeks a year. Okay, okay. good point. 
Okay, so as I as I'd said earlier, we, we do a good job in the chemical industry by and large because we have learned um, from our accidents. And it's I, when we looked at the tutorial on Thursday and Friday, you may have come to the conclusion perhaps that it is like no one no one's responsible in the chemical industry. We, every company just sort of goes on their own way and does their own thing. Um, there are centralized bodies that, that do have best practices in mind. There are some countries of the world that do legislate safety um, in the chemical industry, but it is still up to us to learn about those incidents and transfer them internally to our companies. As you'll see in Bhopal, the, same, the parent company, Union Carbide, had the identical plant, the same flow sheet in Virginia, USA. And four months prior to the Bhopal accident, they had identified that cause of the accident in Bhopal at the Virginia site. They did not let their other site know in India that that same incident could, could have occurred. Okay? So we saw that in the BP example, the same site in two different countries knew about these problems but did not communicate across within the company. So it is still up to us as engineers to internally be responsible for safety, at the very least from an ethical and a moral point of view. Okay, so let's learn um, from some prior accidents. Uh, as Dr. Marlin has up here on his notes, history will repeat itself. Um, and we are really not that much smarter than the people who, who committed these accidents. When you look at these case studies, you'll sit back and you're like, oh my goodness, how could they possibly have done that? Right? How, why would they even have turned off the safety systems? I would never do that as an engineer. Okay? It's not, that's not always as clear cut as that. Right? If you have a manager and higher levels beating down on you, like get this process started up, and you know that you have to turn off the safety system to start up the process, you may be absolutely going to take that risk. Okay? And that's what happened with Chernobyl. Okay, the operators turned off three safety systems to start the plant up to run an experiment that their higher level people had asked them to do. Okay? So it's not as clear cut as sitting back and looking at this and say, that's stupid, this would never, this would never happen. I would never make that mistake. Okay? So let's, let's at least learn from these and see how we can, um, and this, I, I really like this phrase, make our processes intrinsically safe. Okay? Now that's, Maybe uh, it's, not a, it's not the best way to describe it, but it kind of gets the idea across. When you go to Ikea and buy a piece of furniture, and you have to self-assemble it, which is frustrating maybe, but how many times have you assembled it wrongly? Like you, had to, you got three quarters of the way and you had to undo what you had to do. Has that happened before? No? Yes? yes, yes. One or t once or twice? Okay. It does happen to some extent, but if you pay attention to the IKEA furniture, it is actually intentionally asymmetrical. So to go put something in the wrong way is, is pretty hard. It's not that easy to go assemble it in the wrong way. Okay? So it's, it's not a clear cut idea of intrinsic safety, but it gives you this idea that we try to make our processes so that they cannot be screwed up by operators making a mistake or other engineers or ourselves even going and making a mistake. The process is designed to be built, have safety built into the design from it. Okay? And um, you may argue with IKEA furniture that it isn't always true, but if you look at it carefully, you'll actually pay attention next time when you set up the, the, the lining up of the screws and the bolts to line up two pieces, you'll always see some sort of asymmetry built into it so that you know that it pretty much only goes one way and not the other way. So same idea here. We want to create our processes to be as safe as we can. Um, maybe a, a concrete example that of the Bhopal accident. Bhopal uh, was creating a pesticide, and one of the intermediates in the flow sheet is methyl isocyanate. Now, that's not the only way to create that pesticide. Bayer in Germany creates that same pesticide from the same starting material, but uses a flow sheet that does not create that intermediate. So you could even just from an engineering chemistry design perspective look at if this safety problem exists, how can I even create my process so that that safety issue never even has to occur? 
Okay, so Bayer in Germany had a way to do it without creating that intermediate. Uh, Union Carbide's flow sheet had that intermediate, and um, that's where some of the issues occurred. Okay, so uh, we've experienced a number of accidents uh, in earlier on in the that we haven't really learned from too much. The hydrogen uh, dirigible was um, the pride of Nazi Germany in the 1930s. They flew it over the ocean um, and a lightning bolt hit it and burnt up the hydrogen in there. So not really an intrinsically safe design. Uh, another incident of a, a catastrophic explosion in, the AV, um, in this shuttle uh, was in 1986. I remember this because I was in grade three watching this on TV. And um, this exploded just after its um, takeoff. There was an O-ring in the various connections that joined units up in that rocket. An O-ring was known to not work at colder temperatures. In fact, they'd only ever tested it at 10 degrees Celsius. Their launch that morning was at minus seven. Okay, so it, that rocket O-ring was known and by the engineers had told higher up management, this is not, it's not been validated at lower temperatures. The operation of that O-ring is uncertain at lower temperatures. And we'll, I'll remind me in 4C if you guys take it, uh, there's a good visualization that shows how the report from the engineers to the managers were at, was actually badly written. So bad communication from the engineers to the management was also a contributing factor. They did not state their case clearly enough to emphasize that. Okay? Despite that, management knew of it and overrode the decision to, um, to launch. Okay, so uh, there's some interesting background reading on that that you can uh, obviously look up to to get some more background information. Now, I'd like to focus a bit more on, on chemical plant incidents. So we'll look at, at three incidents. The first one is in Flixborough, Flixborough in the UK in the 1970s. So this plant here um, has what you've all seen in 3K, a series of CSTRs. Okay, so five CSTRs in series, and they're slightly lower, one, one after the other, um, fed by gravity from one to two, to three, to four, to five. Now, when you're connecting C CSTRs, there's a CSTR, there's an impeller, that reactor is shaking, right? There's motion in that reactor as the impeller in one to two to three, each one of those impellers is going on their own. So the connecting pipe you can't just connect a rigid pipe from one to two. That pipe's welds will, will eventually rattle and shake off. Okay? So they have sort of like an accordion type um, system to connect one to two and all the way down. What had happened is that reactor five had a problem and was taken out of service. So to keep production going, um, they bypassed from reactor four to six. Okay, so when we have a series of CSTRs, we, we do that to get a required conversion. But if these units are oversized, if you operate them each slightly differently, you could probably get away with five instead of the six. And that's what happened here. So five went, out, went down. So let's bypass from four to six. They physically removed five and ran a bypass. The connecting pipes were normally 28 inches. The bypass was 20 inches. Okay, so smaller smaller capacity than allowed. So let's go and re just to, so you can read more about the details here in, in Wikipedia, but uh, one th one th there's a few lines here that are interesting. Okay. Um, the disaster involved and may have well been caused by a hasty modification. Mechanical engineering issues with the modification was overlooked by managers, in brackets, chemical engineers. So chemical engineers ran the show Mechanical engineers were not involved in approving that bypass. And the severity of the potential consequences of the failure was not appreciated. Okay. What's the ethical lesson we can learn here? You think back to engineering ethics. Anyone, you've covered engineering ethics, right? So maybe in first year, maybe coming up in, in 4A. We'll look at it a bit in this course. What, there's, there's, there's several ethical things we should and should not do. What's, what happened over here? They approved 
approve work that they weren't qualified to approve? Someone was approving work that they were not qualified to approve. Okay, so we, in this class, probably don't have a great deal of appreciation for the level of detail of mechanical engineers, or civil, or electrical, um, and a variety of other professions. And so if we're asked to approve that work, we should decline that. We should not be doing that. Further down, um, we can read a bit more about it, um, about the cause of the disaster. There's this, uh, the hypothesis about the 20-inch pipe, and there was another 8-inch. Um, so here's, the, here's some of the lessons to be learned. And um, so where possible, the plant should be designed so that failure does not lead to disaster on a time scale too short to permit corrective action. You'll notice with all these accidents, they occur in a very, very short time frame, minutes or hours, okay, which is actually long, but it is, it's too short to take corrective action, especially in plants where um, that action needs to be decided on by more than, multi more than one person. So plants should be designed to run and minimize the rate at which critical decisions, management decisions arise particularly those in which production and safety conflict. Okay, so managers and operating staff are not always available to meet each other regularly. So if those decisions need to be taken in a, uh, rapidly, um, then we should, we should try and design our plants so that those decision-making scale is much, much longer than the frequency at which we can actually meet and discuss and identify safety issues. Um, and here's another interesting and important one. Ma feedback within the management structure should ensure top management understands the responsibilities of their individuals. Okay, so chemical engineers running the plant, this design is proposed by people that really have no skill in mechanical engineering and is approved by people that have no skill in mechanical engineering. If you go read uh, some of the specifics earlier up here, they talk all about the stresses on that pipe and how... Um, how it really wasn't thought out, and the design was not approved by um, a trained, qualified person. What's also really interesting is that the bypass actually ran successfully to, for two months. And that's probably the most insidious aspect of this accident, is that the, that the fix worked for two, for two months. Okay, it worked long enough to give people confidence. In fact, it worked long enough that they went back to their reactor and the piping, and this connection needed insulation and cladding, and they even cladded that bypass, and it sort of almost became a permanent feature now. But what happened then is when uh, they had to depressurize the system and repressurize it, during that bringing the plant back up again, so start up, again, this is a classic startup accident, um, those stresses and strains in that uh, were not able to be withstood during the startup. Okay, so uh, that's something that a, a trained person would have considered as well. It's not just steady state operation, but, but um, the abnormalities of startup and shutdown. Okay, so there's a bit more detail here in the write-up from Dr. Marlin to, to fill in some of the the issues behind it. But essentially, uh, startup was late, late in the afternoon. Sorry, they started up in the morning by about four, um, four five o'clock in the afternoon is when the, the explosion occurred. And the background here is that had the explosion occurred on a weekday, uh, far more people would have been injured. This was on a Saturday afternoon, so, oh, so 15 um, staff in the control room were, were killed. Now, Here's, a, here's another one, um, 1986, so April 1986, Chernobyl. So Flixborough was in 74. Okay, yeah, so 74, 86. So this gives, uh, I'm emphasizing the dates just to give you a feel for how fast the industry moves or, or slow it moves from your perspective. Um, Chernobyl is a nuclear incident. Now, I don't, I do not understand the details and the intricacies of the nuclear industry and their safety. So I'm not going to go into the causes and the process of the accident because I, I'm certainly not qualified to, to talk about it. 
Um, there is a, a very extensive article here, of course, in Wikipedia, as well as other resources that talk about the actual step-by-step -step changes that occurred. But I do want to point out the following um, issues. The plant, the nuclear plant, like any chemical plant, and this is where we can learn from this, any plant has a range of operation. So a distillation column, we can operate it from zero kilograms per hour of feed up to whatever the design case is for. Let's say 1,000 kilograms per hour. When we started up, we're obviously bringing it up from zero to steady state. But as you're aware, it may be that economics dictate that we move to a lower operating point just because there's not demand for our product or downstream sections of our process need to be slowed down for repairs. So we can often bring our pro process to a percentage of turn down. So instead of operating at 100%, we can use this phrase, turn down our process to 30%, 40%, 50%, some lower flow through the system. Okay. Now, in distillation columns, we can't always do that because the column may, um, may start weeping. Now, the same idea in the nuclear reactor. In this particular reactor, it had a design feature in it that prevented it from operating at very low rates. And the lead operator here was doing an experiment. They'd shut the plant down. We're going to start it up. And they figure, well, let's do an experiment to see where this lower bound is. So they're doing an experiment intentionally. And to do that experiment, the operators were not very well trained behind that were actually running it. And so one of the leading causes that we read about here in Chernobyl is operators being asked to do stuff that they weren't well trained to do. And three control systems were turned off. The first was the cooling system. The second was an automatic control system. And the third was a power reduction system. Chernobyl happened because a power surge occurred. And this design, when it operated at, counterintuitively operated at low rates, actually could lead to power surges. And that power surge created an excess of steam and you put an excess of steam in a closed contained unit, it blows. So it was a steam explosion that lifted the containment and the roof of the reactor. And there were some other issues in the system that uh, then once it exploded, it obviously leads to a release of radioactive material. But some other features in the design were also dangerous. For example, they used bitumen in the construction. And once bitumen is set alight, that just propagates a fire. And that was contrary to the design specs. So shortcuts had been taken in the construction phase. So where I'm going with this particular incident is making changes to a system that are well beyond the level of typical operation. There were control systems, three of them, in place to prevent operating the reactor at low rates. But in order to run the experiments, they turned them off intentionally. Okay. So Turning off of safety equipment is a theme, and we'll see that again in the next case study. Now, just want to um, give a quote, actually. It's kind of interesting. The lead commissioner that investigated the accident after the fact um, equated what the operators were doing here would be no different to an airplane pilot experimenting with the engines during flight. Okay, is essentially what, what they were doing here. Playing around, experimenting on the system while, while in operation and with very little um, training. In fact, another aspect that you read about here is that the operating staff were told in very short time frame what they were asked to do and had inadequate time to prepare and, and understand what they were being asked. Okay, so they, they, even the staff really didn't have time to think through what they were being asked to do and maybe raise potential objections. Okay, so while we're, while we're on this point, I mean, I just want to talk a bit about why Chernobyl is considered a, a catastrophic accident. It's considered the most severe nuclear accident um, in, in, one of, in recent history. The reason is because it breached several layers. Um, in class on Wednesday, we're going to learn about 
our hierarchy, we have a basic process control system. So these are your P and I D control loops that run all the time in the background and just keep you at set points. Above that control system, we have alarms, which will kick in when the sensors read values that are too low or too high than what they should be. So we have these alarms that will audibly um, or visually inform the operators of a problem. The third layer that we in implement is a safety interlock system. So these are automated systems that will try to bring the process to a safe operating point when a problem occurs. And that's what these what they had turned off here during the experiment. So SIS was switched off. There was three different SIS safety interlock systems that were turned off. The next layer of protection that we implement is relief. Okay, so if we're not able to control our system and the safety interlock system can't automatically bring us to a safe operating point, we try to get rid of the material that, um, that's causing the issue and we relieve it safely. So we don't just throw it up into the air, we, we get rid of it in a safe manner. We'll talk about that coming up. The fifth layer of protection is containment. Now, in your career, hopefully the only level that you should ever experience and it should be SIS, but you will likely experience relief. You'll almost certainly see a relief system operating. Okay. But the fifth level is something that I hope you never have to experience, and that's containment, where we build a container around our system to hold the spill. In a nuclear facility, the reason why nuclear is expensive is because there's this tremendous thick concrete bunker under which the reactor core operates, and that is there to contain the system. And in Chernobyl's case, that was breached. So all these layers were breached. And then the sixth system is something we never planned for, but that's emergency response. Okay, so firefighters, ambulances, hospitals to come assist. But that's a layer that we, we should never rely on. Okay, so so Chernobyl was significant because it breached all the way up to the fifth, fifth layer over there. Okay, and then Bhopal in India is a case study. I, we probably don't have enough time. My hope for this class was to pause here and give you all about five, six minutes to go read the Bhopal case study and I was going to divide you up into sections and have you look at different aspects. But I'll ask you to do that uh, regardless on your own. Let me just recap what we would have discovered in that, in that study. If we had looked up the information about Bhopal, it occurred in 1984. Okay, so again, we're coming up to the 30th anniversary of this incident. December 1984, a cold night in India and an inversion had formed. So an inversion is when your, your layers in your atmosphere form in such a way that any release doesn't go up. The temperature above is warmer and it, cap, it keeps their air in. So the air is trapped over that region. Um, methyl isocyanate was released. Okay, 42 tons of methyl isocyanate. It killed 3,700 people that instant, instantaneously, and over the next two weeks, another 16,000. The release of that material was because it was contacted with water. So when we learned about operability in our processes, Dr. Marlin uh, showed you this idea that you can have one part of your process and then a tank to hold the material while process one might be shut down. And then that storage tank goes to a second part of your process. So if you need to maintain P1, you can use the tank. If you need to maintain P2, you can use the tank uh, as a storage location. So this is exactly what Bhopal had, was doing here. They had this tank 
to store the intermediate, methyl isocyanate, MIC. MIC is stored in a tank, and they had overfilled the tank. It was beyond the capacity which it should have been, so they were at a very, very high level, 42 tons of that material. Methyl, methyl isocyanate is reactive to water. How did water get into that tank? Well, there's two theories. One is that it was sabotage, and there's a lot of information that you can go read on the website about that. Uh, so that's, that's the official company, Union Carbide. That's their position, that they were sabotaged by an employee. The other interpretation, uh, sorry, the other uh, sequence of events that are proposed is that this was an accident that was caused by someone cleaning the pipes with water, which is a regular part of the, the procedure at the company, is to clean the pipes out with water. And to, the company obviously knows that water is extremely reactive with methyl isocyanate, so they have several things in place, one of which is multiple valves to keep that pipeline shut, and the second is that there are plates, so literally a vertical plate that you can put in the pipe to prevent any material flowing into the tank. So it's called a blind, a blind stop or a blind plate there to prevent that flow of water in. That unit often got maintained and in the checklist to, re, re get the, to start the unit back up again, the installation of the blind plate was omitted. Okay, so that wasn't on, on there and so that plate was not installed and so when the unit was cleaned, water entered. So whether water entered by sabotage or whether it entered there because of an accident, it doesn't really matter too much from our perspective looking at it as engineers. How could we have made this process safer? Well, the company had four ways that they did this. The first way that they, that they had to, to prevent that is that they, had, they knew that should water enter, it's going to release gas and build up pressure and need to be vented. So they had a scrubber. So as this material is relieved, so we're at this stage, we've got water in our system, there's a reaction, there's a build up, it needs to be relieved. They had a scrubber in place, multiple scrubbers in place, only one of which was running. And that scrubber was actually, didn't have sodium hydroxide to make it operate. Even if it had, that single scrubber would have only been able to process one quarter of the material because it was one of a sequence of scrubbers. The others were just taken out, okay, out for, main, for maintenance or were not operational. So that relief system was breached. Uh, the flare. So when we relieve, we'll tr try to pre-treat our material, and if we can't pre-treat it, we'll send it to a relief. So these, these flames that we see, the pipe connecting the scrubber to the relief system had been removed. Okay, so the, the flare, while it, there was a flare, it was not in operation. Okay, so that second system was not in place. They also knew that if they keep the temperature of the methyl isocyanate down to four degrees, it minimizes any problems with the reaction. To save costs, the company had turned off the refrigeration system. And so the temperature of the, that MIC was at 20 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that, they know all of this. They've built these systems into place. But due to cost cutting and due to poor maintenance, they had not kept their safety systems in place. Okay? And then the fourth item was the slip plates. Those slip plates or those blind plates were not in the checklist in the procedure for the operators to check. So all of these systems, physical systems that are there to keep the process safe had been turned off or um, due to economics or, or just bad, bad maintenance and bad management. Okay, so we're seeing a consistent pattern here that despite some of the engineering systems we have in place, that they can be defeated by our, in, by our staff and by bad management pressured by economics. Okay. So all of those factors led, led to that. There are some other factors, the fact that those tanks were well beyond the level that they should have been. Um, the safety systems that they did have in place were not maintained. They used carbon steel in their pipes, despite knowing that, those, that carbon steel would be corroded by acid. 
And in fact, the iron oxide in the corroded pipes served as a catalyst which accelerated the reaction with methyl isocyanate and water. Okay. So bad materials of construction choices just intensified the outcome of that, that problem. Um, also what I found the most insidious, as I said, is that their Virginia plant, the same parent company, did not forward their safety audit to Bhopal, despite knowing that Bhopal had the same flow sheet. They did not inform, the one side of the company did not inform the other, and that's a huge ethical breach. As engineers, when you're working in your company, you, more than anyone else, probably have a global awareness of what units are operating in your company around the world, and identifying a shortcoming in one site doesn't mean just to fix it at one location. You have that obligation to make sure that the message spreads around internally to your company. We see at, um, if you attend engineering conferences, there's almost always a safety se section, and it is not uncommon that companies share safety incidents that have occurred. Okay. So uh, another part of informing each other of safety accidents is at these conferences between companies and within your company, you have that obligation as well. Okay, so that's um, some of the messages I wanted to get across with, uh, with these case studies. There's, there's two others. Um, I'll probably pick them up at the start of next class related to dust explosions and um, this incident in Seveso. So what I'll do at this point is I'll, I'll just pause. Um, I'm going to hand out the midterms. Hira is at the back. Uh, he's going to come here to the front.